Hey guys, so this video is going to go over how the cell cycle is regulated. We're going to talk about how we regulate cellular division, in this case specifically mitosis. We're also going to talk about how cancer can be introduced through a lack of regulation of the cell cycle. So here we go. So to be a multicellular organism, it means that you are made up of billions and billions of cells, and all of those cells are pretty much almost responsible for themselves, including their division. Because a cell, depending on what kind of cell it is, is going to have a very specific lifespan, some live longer, some live for a shorter amount of time, it means that you're constantly coordinating the entire organism, that is, is constantly coordinating cellular division from bunches of tissues and bunches of organs, continuously. Like at any given time, half your cells are dividing themselves. That's just how it works when you're multicellular. So it's important because if, you, if your cells didn't divide, there wouldn't be normal growth, there wouldn't be development, and there wouldn't be any maintenance either. You couldn't repair yourself when damaged, and you couldn't make new cells when you needed them, when the old ones died. So to coordinate cell division, you have to coordinate timing. You also have to coordinate the rate at which cell division is taking place, and you have to keep in mind that not every cell in your body is going to have the same length of a cell cycle. All the parts and pieces work the same. We still have G1, S, G2, mitosis, and then cytokinesis, but we might be in longer, in different phases for a longer period of time, depending on what kind of cell we are. So, like I just said, how often you divide depends on what kind of cell you are. When you are, in an em when you are an embryo, you're dividing every 20 minutes or so. I mean, you're trying to grow an entire organism from one tiny cell. When you are since when you're a skin cell, sorry, I can't talk. <laughs> you're dividing constantly throughout your life, and it happens within a 12 to 24 hour period. That's how long your cell cycle is going to take you. When you're a liver cell. While you can still divide if you need to, you kind of hold on to that. That's like your backup, backup, backup plan. So liver cells really only divide every couple of years, like every one year or every two years, just depending. They don't do it constantly. When we think about cells that are mature things like nerve cells and muscle cells, once they've hit maturity, they don't divide at all. They're permanently in that resting phase, in that G0 phase that happens right after G1. So how quickly you divide and how often you divide just depends on what you are. So let's talk about generally how we're going to be able to control this level of division. There are two points that are pretty much the point of no return. Once you get to that stage, you cannot reverse it. There's no turning back. You, you can't go backwards. And those two points that are irreversible are the replication of our genetic material. Once we've made a copy, the copy's there. We have to do something up with it. And the separation of sister chromatids. So when we separate a replicated chromosome into its two halves. Once we do those two steps, we're moving. We're shaking. We can't ever go back. You can't rejoin chromosomes that have been separated. You also can't take back DNA that you've copied. It's pretty simple. We give those, those events within the cell cycle the name of a checkpoint. So it's literally like a checklist. Did I do this? Yes, I did. Did I do that? Yes, I did. Okay, now I can move on to the next step. So a checkpoint is a place during the cell cycle that the process itself can be paused, looked at or assessed, and then we can make some changes if we need to. Oh, we didn't do this step well enough. Let's pause in this part of the cell cycle and stay here long enough that we can get our job accomplished. For example, if you're in S phase, the job at that stage is to make a copy of every single chromosome in that cell. So during the checkpoint, the cell assesses itself. Let's see, I have 26 chromosomes. Oh crap, they've only copied 13, I'm going to have to wait until they've copied the other 13. We're going to take a pause until all of them have been, have been copied or have been replicated. So that would be a checkpoint. So pretty much a checkpoint in a cell cycle is either like a red light, 
or a green light stop signal or a go signal but of course these are chemical signals and they happen at crucial or points of no return within your cell cycle the signals indicate that key processes have been completed and they've been completed correctly so that's what your checkpoint is all about we're gonna stop we're gonna assess the situation if everything is done to our liking we can keep it moving if things are not done to our liking, we're going to have to wait until it is either finished or it's corrected. So there are three main checkpoints within your cell cycle if, you look, if you're looking at the screen. There's one major checkpoint in G1. Ironically enough, it's called the G1 checkpoint. Notice there is no checkpoint in S phase, but there is a checkpoint at the very end, almost the beginning of mitosis, and there is another checkpoint during the middle part of mitosis itself. So the G checkpoint is called G2 checkpoint, and the checkpoint that happens in mitosis is called the M checkpoint. Like I said, three major checkpoints. Now, the first one does happen in G1, but be, we kind of call it the G1S checkpoint. And we call it, we consider S in this checkpoint because this is what your cell is checking. Have I started to synthesize my DNA? Or has my DNA been synthesized? Are we working on that? When we get to the G2 checkpoint, that's between G2 and M, we're thinking of, okay, has all of my DNA been completely copied correctly? And am I ready to go into mitosis? If the answer is yes, that my DNA has been synthesized and it's been copied and everything's good to go there, I'm going into mitosis. Now, the spindle checkpoint is another name for that second M checkpoint, the one that's in the middle of M. And it's called the spindle checkpoint because it's a check for the actual spindles. So the spindle checkpoint does the following. Are all the chromosomes attached to a spindle? Can they be moved? Can I separate my sister chromatids properly? If I can say yes to both of those, I go ahead and move. I move into the next phase. So these are the three major checkpoints or the three major controls of your cell cycle. Another name that you might see in the place of checkpoint is the name restriction point. It means the same thing. Okay, so our G1 or S checkpoint, G1 S checkpoint, is the most critical checkpoint of the three. It is the very first decision our cell is going to make. Okay, So it's a restriction point. If everything is happening great, we will move ahead. But if not, we're going to restrict progress. We're going to stop. You are not going to go ahead. So if the cell receives the go signal, and I'm saying go in quotation marks like you can see me, anyway, it divides. Now, there are a bunch of signals that the cell will work with. Some of them are going to be internal signals, and some of them are going to be external signals. So here are the things we're going to check for. We're going to check internally to make sure that my cell has been growing, because this cell is about to divide. If it's a puny, tiny little cell, when you divide it, you're going to make two puny, tiny little cells, which really defeats the purpose. Okay? So you want to make sure that the cell has grown and it's gained in size. You want to make sure that the cell has adequate nutrition so that all parts and pieces have what they need to actually work. That's your internal signals. Your external signals, signals sorry, are the growth factors that your cell is responding to. It can't grow if it doesn't get the signal to grow. So if a cell does not receive a signal, meaning like I don't get a growth factor, for example, then I stop at G1. I'm going to go straight into my G0 phase, which means that I'm not going to divide. I'm always going to be in interphase. Okay? But once I have gotten my growth factors and I grow and I have my nutrition, I have passed my first checkpoint. I'm going to move into S. So let's talk about G0 a little bit. Like we said, G0 just means that your cell's not actively dividing. It's reached maturity, but it's not actively dividing. Quite a bit of our cells are in the G0 phase. If you think in terms of, of mass, in terms of bulk of our body, most of them are in G0. 
like we talked about before, our liver cells are in G0, but they have the ability to divide as a backup plan. So they can still go back and get external cues, and they can still divide and grow if they need to. But it's like they're on freeze mode, if you want to think of it that way. Our nerve cells and our muscle cells are very specialized for the jobs they do. Any and every cell couldn't just jump up and be a muscle cell, at least not once they've reached maturity. So because they're so specialized, you tend to replace them slower because they're no longer lived, and they're what we call arrested in G0. Once they've gotten to that G0 stage, once they've committed to becoming G0 or to going into G0, they can never come out, so they can never divide again. If we lose some muscle cells, we'll just have to make new ones. All right? So hopefully that's clear. Where are we going to make the new ones from? From stem cells, from pluripotent cells. So how do cells even know when, it, when they need to divide? Well, remember we went through that whole section on cell communication? Yeah, it comes back to bite you in the butt. Here it is again. Your cells know when to divide because of the signals that they can receive and interpret through cell communication. Some of those signals can originate from another cell that's already going through division, and it can almost prompt a non-dividing cell to divide. So those cells, those signals, sorry, are going to come straight through the cytoplasm and cue the non-dividing cell into dividing. Now, you should be familiar with this already, but in biology, when we say signal, especially when we're talking about communication, you know we're talking about some kind of protein. And these proteins can either be activators, we're going to start off a sequence of events, or they can be inhibitors, we're going to stop a sequence of events. Okay, so some of these protein signals are what I like to call go-ahead signals. They're green light signals. They're signals that will promote cell growth and division. Again, they can be internal or external. To be honest, this is a part of the cell cycle that is very that we don't have a cl completely clear understanding of its regulation. We have snapshots of what happens in certain circumstances, so that's the information that we go based on. But because we're talking about something so very tiny that we can't really see, it's, it's hard to have the entire picture, so I just kind of want you to know that. So anyway, so these protein signals that are going to promote cell growth and division can be both internal signals and external signals. The internal signals are called MPFs, or mitosis promoting factors. We're promoting mitosis. We are starting mitosis off on its merry way. Whereas the external signals are called growth factors. The whole point of being able to get to, the, to mitosis is you want to grow. We want to make you bigger, so before we can let you divide, you have to be bigger. The way this all works, the control mechanism is the same control mechanism we've been using in cell communication. It's the same control mechanism that we use when we talk about respiration and photosynthesis. It's that process of phosphorylation, just trading off a phosphate group from one thing to another. Remember, phosphorylation is controlled by kinase enzymes. They're those little like scissor enzymes, the cutting enzymes. They literally cut phosphate off of one group and transfer it to another. That simple act of moving a phosphate group around can either activate or inactivate a cell signal, just depending on what we do. So in terms of cell, of cell cycle controls, there are a couple of different proteins that I'd like you to know. The first ones are called cyclins. If you look at the picture, here's a representation of a cyclin. A cyclin is a regulatory protein, and it's called cyclins because the amount of cyclin you have in your cell rises and falls depending on where in the cell cycle you are. So their levels cycle in the cell, so they are called cyclins. The next set of proteins that I want you to be familiar with are a type of enzyme that are called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. I tell you over and over again, nearly daily, names in biology are important. So CDKs can only work when cyclins are available. They are cyclin dependent. So CDKs are kinases, which means they're going to do some phosphorylation. They will phosphorylate cellular proteins. 
And through phosphorylation, what they're really going to do is either activate or inactivate certain kinds of proteins. When cyclin and CDKs come together, when they're connected together, they make what we call the CDK cyclin complex. So this association here would be an example of a CDK cyclin complex, once they're actually fitted together. Once they fit together like that, it's going to trigger a passage of different stages in your cell cycle. So it's going to promote the movement through the cell cycle. All right, so here's an example of what we talk, what we mean when we say that cyclins cycle within the, the um, various stages of your cell cycle. Now, the interaction of your CDKs and these cyclin proteins, that's going to trigger your advancement to the, the series within your cell cycle. So mitosis G1, S, G2, mitosis G1, S, G2, mitosis. Look at what happens whenever you see mitosis. There's mitosis here and here and here. Your mitosis promoting factors are high. You have a lot of them. It makes sense. You're in mitosis. You need to have factors that will promote division. Look at your levels of cyclin. They're fairly high as well. Now, before we move on to the next phase, like if you look at the G's, we're going to see a small decrease, or a steady decrease, I should say, in our MPFs because we're no longer in mitosis. We don't need to promote mitosis anymore. And as the cyclin levels fall and raise, we go through the different series of the, of the cell cycle. So we're high in mitosis for a cyclin, and then we drop suddenly. And then as we increase, we go from G1 all the way to G2 until we're in M again. So one way of thinking about it is your cycling activity is highest in M and lowest in G1. And then it increases between G1 and G2 until it's high again in, in M. The only time we see a lot of mitosis promoting activity is when we are in mitosis. That, that should correlate. That should make sense to you. All right, so let's go through it. Here is your entire cell cycle with the cartoon representation that hopefully you are fairly familiar with. Sorry that my phone keeps going off. Like For some reason, I'm like extra popular tonight. I don't know why. Anyway, so here is our cartoon depiction of all the, the entire cell cycle. Starting, and you have to get familiar with these being turned around. Like none of our cell cycle pictures ever look the same. No two cell cycle pictures look the same. It's always going to be a circle, but where they put the different parts and pieces can move around all the time. So we start off in mitosis where we actually have division. Then the C rep here represents cytokinesis. Then we go to G1, then to S, then to G2. Excuse me. So on this diagram, I've included the three major checkpoints and what we're going to check for, excuse me, and what we're going to check for. So in G1, we're going to look at CDK and cyclin activity, okay? We're going to be checking for growth factors, and we're going to be checking for the nutritional state of the cell, and we're going to be checking for size. The growth factor is going to tell us to grow. It's an external, external signal. We are going to get bigger in response to that growth factor, giving us enough material that when that cell decides to split into two, we have enough cytoplasm and everything else for both cells. The nutritional state of the cell is going to determine how well and how quickly that cell can grow. If that cell is starved for nutritional material, we can't grow that fast. But if we're if there's a lot of nutrition just sorry, if there's a lot of nutritional material available, we can grow quicker. Okay, in S, all we're doing here is we are copying our DNA. So once the DNA has been copied, we will move to G2, where we are growing, we're replicating our organelles, and just making sure that we have enough of everything for the new cells we're about to make. So that leads us to our second checkpoint. Again, we're going to be looking at CDK and cyclin levels, but for the first time, we're also going to be looking at mitosis promoting factors. Remember, we're getting closer to mitosis. We, sh mitosis sorry. we should start to see an increase in these. So at that second checkpoint, we're going to make sure that all of replication has taken place, 
and we're going to check DNA integrity. Ha have we actually copied the DNA correctly? Once those things have been achieved, we're going to move into mitosis. So in mitosis, we're doing the spindle checkpoint. We want to make sure that all the chromosomes have attached themselves to a correct spindle and that the kinetochores, the proteins that hold them together, can actually be split apart. Now I'm going to introduce another new acronym here. This one is called APC. APC stands for Anaphase Promoting Complex. Anaphase, as hopefully you remember from freshman year, is one of the phases within mitosis. It's the phase where the chromosomes start to pull apart so that we have equal numbers in both cells. We want an increase in anaphase promoting complex because we want anaphase to take place. So we need that complex or the, those systems of proteins to increase in amount because that's going to make anaphase happen and hopefully happen correctly. And that's pretty much the entire cell cycle, including checkpoints. So this whole cell cycle is driven because of your cyclin-dependent kinases and your cyclin levels. Now, I want to make a point that the amount of CDKs you have is pretty much constant. Like, the actual amount of molecules you have is constant during the cell cycle. But their activity is going to vary based on function, okay? And it's based on the um, the action of these cyclins. When you have a lot of cyclins, you're going to have a lot of CDK activity. But when you have a decrease in cyclins, you're going to have less CDK activity. Okay, so it's more about how often they work as opposed to how many of them they are. So to properly regulate your cell cycle, I mean, you need this combination, these cyclins and these CDKs. Your cycle needs to be regulated so that your genes are correct. Now one thing that we've noticed as we've gone over and we've looked at various organisms from very primitive to very complex, the genes that code for these regulatory proteins of the cell cycle have been highly conserved through evolution. It just means that it's pretty much the same genes that controls the cell cycle in a prokaryote. It's going to be those same genes that will control them in a eukaryote. It's the classic case of if it's not broken, don't fix it. All right. So in any organism you can think of, from something as simple as yeast so, so, to something as complex as an elephant, it's the same genes, the same proteins doing the same function. It doesn't. It's it's not worth fixing if it's not broken. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about these external factors a little bit. Like for example. The growth factors, those are the main ones, the ones we're really concerned with. So growth factors have to coordinate between cells. It saves your cell a lot of effort, not to mention efficiency, if everything that needs to grow grows around the same time and around the same rate. So one of the big issues or one of the big things that growth factors do is they coordinate the pattern, the pattern of growth among cells or between cells. They are protein signals and they're released by body cells so that they can stimulate other body cells. So if I'm a cell over here and I'm reproducing or I'm growing, I want the cell next to me to grow, I want the cell in front of me to grow, I want the cell behind me to grow, so I'm going to send out growth factors. Those growth factors are going to make their way through the cell membrane into the cytoplasm via all the methods we talked about in cellular communication, and it's going to promote growth in all the cells surrounding me. So there are two ways that this can happen. The first way is called density-dependent inhibition. And it's kind of the way a cell knows when it's time to stop growing. And this method, I think, for the most part, was perfected. Like, we figured out how this method worked in the lab. So you put a couple of cells into a Petri dish, and you make sure that they have adequate space and nutrition, and you leave them alone for a couple of hours. And you're going to come back and realize that those cells have started to grow. It's because cells don't like to be by themselves. They're used to being in tissue format. They want to be in a tissue format. So all of these cells are going to start growing. And then they're going to encourage new cells to grow and new cells to grow and grow and grow and grow until you have a lawn of cells where they evenly cover the area that they're in. Now, once you have an even spread of the cells, 
they're going to start crowding each other. As soon as they start crowding each other, they realize, hey, we're running out of space. We need to stop all this growth. So they themselves stop dividing. Each cell in turn is going to bind a little bit of the growth factor. So it's going to hold on to the growth factor so that the growth factor can't cause any of the other cells to keep growing. So once that growth factor has been stopped, once it's not moving around from cell to cell anymore, it's not going to trigger cell division in any of the cells, and the entire thing stops growing. We just have, uh, excuse me, we just have a bunch of cells that are there, but they're not actively dividing. The other thing your growth factors are in charge of is something called anchorage dependence. To divide, your cells must be attached to a substrate. So we call this like touch sensation, like touch sensors. Those cells can feel if they are attached to something. That's why in your body, your cells are anchored to like different types of tissue. Each cell is anchored to itself. It's also anchored to what it's in. In this container, these cells are anchored to a substrate that has been placed in here. So if a cell can't feel that there's another cell next to it or one underneath it, it will promote growth so that it can then feel new cells around it. Once it's all felt up, if that makes any sense, once it can tell that there's cells all around it, it'll stop growing. It'll hold on to those growth factors so that we don't continue to grow. Now, hopefully this looks familiar. Remember, these guys are proteins. That means that they're coming in via a protein receptor on the surface of the cell membrane, which is going to trigger a series of phosphorylations until we end up with the result that we want. Okay, so let's look at an example of a growth factor. Platelet-derived growth factor, or PDGF, is an example of a growth factor that works exactly like the way we just described. It's made by platelets and blood clots. And when, you, when these PDGFs bind to cell receptors, they stimulate cell division in connective tissue. So when you cut your, your hand open because you weren't being careful, the underlying tissue just underneath your skin, which is what your skin is pretty much attached to, is going to start rapidly dividing so that that wound can be sealed up. And that happens because of these platelet-derived growth factors. Okay? So it's the same concept. The cells can tell that they're, they're all of a sudden not touching cells around them because of that anchorage dependence, and they start sending out growth factors. Those growth factors are going to promote growth and division in every cell in the area until you end up with a covering over your wound. Because of density-dependent inhibition, the cells can tell, okay, we're all back together, we're going to stop growing now. This is how wounds healed. Heal, not healed, but heal. Okay, now, when growth factors work, they really work. And that's why, or that's one of the main issues with cancer. Growth factors can create cancers. Because if you think about it, a cancer cell or a cancerous cell is just one that continually divides. It's constantly growing, and it ignores all the signals to stop. So the way it works is because of something called proto-oncogenes. Now, proto-oncogenes normally activate cell division. They're another kind of growth factor. They're growth factor genes. They become oncogenes, or cancer-causing, when they mutate. So let's think about it this way. When they are proto-oncogenes, they're not cancer-causing. But when they are oncogenes, when they lose the proto part, they are cancer-causing. That is a mutation. So in this form, these genes are turned off. So they're working the way we want them to. They're activating cell division. But in this form, they are turned on. They are switched on. And that causes cancer. Rapid growth. Activation of more cyclins and more CDK activity than that cell needs. So it just keeps growing and growing and growing constantly. Now, on the flip side, you have another set of genes that are called tumor suppressor genes. And these genes can inhibit cell division if it's happening too rapidly or too quickly or just uncontrolled. Now, normally, these genes are switched on. When they're switched on, 
they inhibit cell division if cell division needs to be stopped. But if these genes get turned off, they can cause cancer. Okay, so let's do it again because that sometimes is confusing. Proto-oncogenes activate cell division. When they are on, they can cause cancer because cell division happens all the time, constantly, nothing stopping it. Tumor suppressor genes inhibit cell division. Okay, when you turn them off, they cause cancer because there's nothing there to stop cell division if it goes out of control. So an example of a proto-oncogene is the gene RAS, whereas an example of a tumor suppressor gene is the gene P53. We're going to look at some of these in depth in like two seconds. Okay, so let's talk about how non-regulation of the cell cycle or issues in the cell cycle can cause cancer. Cancer is pretty much a complete failure of your cell division control, complete failure of the cell cycle. It is unrestrained and uncontrolled growth. Cells are just growing and dividing before they're ready, sometimes before all the DNA is copied or before all the organelles are copied or before the cell is big enough to support two new cells. So it's just uncontrolled, unrestrained growth. What controls are lost? Well, the checkpoints are lost. Remember, your checkpoints are your points where you say, huh, did I do this, this, and this? Yes, I did. Okay, I can move on. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to do this. Well, I can't move on yet. I need to pause until I get everything on my list done. So it's what happens when the red lights stop working at your checkpoints. Think about it in real life. If red lights stopped working, some of these crazy mesquite drivers that we have will not actually slow down and do you know, the whole like four-way stop or you got here first, now you can go. No, everyone's just going to try to go and it's going to be total chaos. Well, it's the same thing here. All of the red lights or all of the signals that stop uncontrolled growth are no longer working. So the cell's just growing. It's just doing its own thing. The gene P53 plays a key role in the very first checkpoint or restriction point, that G1S restriction point. If you think back, I said this one is the most crucial. So if we mess up at the very first one, we're, we're kind of doomed almost. Well, not exactly, but you know. So P53 is going to halt cell division if it detects damaged DNA. So it's going to pause it and say, okay, let's see what's going on. There is an issue here. What can we do? It can either stimulate enzymes to fix the damaged DNA. It can force the cell to go into a G0 resting stage. It can arrest the cell in G1, keep it in G1. Or if the DNA is beyond fixing, it can cause apoptosis. Okay, so think of your P53 gene as like your major cell enforcer. This is the best of the best of the best of the best of the best. Look at all the things that it can do just from detecting that DNA is damaged. So it means that for cancer to actually have control, cancer has to shut down P53 activity completely. All cancers have to be able to do that. And since we definitely know that there's cancer, that means that they all can. All right, so let's look at how it, it works. P53 is sometimes called, in terms of the cell cycle, the master regulator gene. So when you have normal P53, there's a damaged section of DNA. And that damage can be caused by radiation, by heat, by chemicals, whatever. So your P53 gene goes in. It assesses the damage and realizes, okay, we're missing some bases or we have mismatched bases or whatever the issue is. So the first step that it's always going to try to do is it's going to, first of all, stop cell division, and then it's going to try to get enzymes to repair the damaged region of DNA. If the region that's damaged is, is repaired, then the cell can go through cell division as normal, and we can divide and end up with two daughter cells like we should. But if we can't fix the cell, and we can't arrest the cell until it's fixed, and we can't pause the cell until it's fixed, 
then the next option is to destroy the cell. Sometimes we have to make hard choices, and P53 is that protein that will do that. It will make the hard choices. So in the situation where we can't fix DNA, P53 is going to trigger that cell to be destroyed. It's going to trigger apoptosis. That's how our normal P53 protein works. But when we have an abnormal P53 protein, this is what happens. There's still DNA damage, but the abnormal P53 protein fails to stop cell division. Cell, cell division does not get paused. And if we don't pause it, we can't repair the DNA that has been damaged. So the cell just continues to divide with damaged DNA that has never been repaired. So we just divide and divide and divide and divide and divide with a, with D, a, a, a piece of DNA that's not working right, that can't work right because it is damaged. So as we keep dividing, if we create more damage to our DNA, and every time we divide, remember, we're, we're making copies of the damaged section. So over time, it accumulates, and that cell becomes cancerous. Okay, so hopefully that, that was clear. Feel free to ask me questions in class about it. So if we think about cancer, cancer is a really smart disease because there are six different things, six different cell experiences, or six crucial mutations, or hits as we like to call them, that has to happen for cancer to develop. The first thing is we have to have unlimited growth, which means that we've turned on growth promoter genes. We have to ignore our checkpoints. So if we've ignored our checkpoints, it means that we're turning off tumor suppressor genes, like that P53 gene, for example. We have to escape apoptosis. If we escape apoptosis, apoptosis sorry, it means that we've turned off all of our suicide genes. We have to have immortality, unlimited divisions, which means that we've turned on some chromosome maintenance genes. Normally, each cell can only divide so many times because then you start breaking your chromosomes apart and there's nothing to copy. Well, if cancer cells can circumvent that, if we can turn on genes that will just allow us endless chromosomes, for lack of a better term, we're always... Um, copying those chromosomes, we can divide unlimited times. Cancer cells have to promote blood vessel growth. They need their own supply of blood because they need their own nutrients. So we have to turn on blood vessel growth genes. We have to overcome both anchorage and density dependence. Our cells forget that they're crowded. They forget that there's cells completely surrounding them. So we're turning off that touch sensor gene. So we just grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. It's like you have all these systems failing and there's nothing that anyone can do. It's just this rapid, uncontrollable growth. So what can trigger these mutations? <laughs> the list is endless. The main ones are things like UV radiation. Guess what? We all have to go outside at some point. Chemical exposure. So many things are chemicals, from the hairspray you spray to the deodorant you use to the soaps that you bathe with. They're, they're chemicals in everything, even our food. Radiation exposure. Heat. For Christ's sakes, we live in Texas. There's heat everywhere during the summertime. Cigarette smoke. Pollution. Age. And even genetics. Some of us are prone to cancers, and there's not a whole lot that can necessarily be done at this stage in the game. So if you look at our picture here, we have a tumor that's growing. It, tumors always start off the same way, and it's so sad when you think about it. All of it starts the same way. It starts from a single rogue cell. One single cell that decides to be a bad you-know-what, and just do what it wants. Then those cancer cells, they're, they're, they pretty much take over. They just start spreading. And they're just going to invade any neighboring tissue. It doesn't matter if the tissue is healthy or not. They're just going to take over. Then after they've gotten so big, they start to do something called mastitis. They mastitize where they break off. Sections of them break off. And through your lymph, your lymphatic um, system, sorry, had a blank there. Through your lymphatic system and your circulatory system, they just spread and attach themselves to other parts of your body. Normally, by the time we get to this stage, there, there's not a whole lot that can be done. 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about tumors. Now, there are two kinds of tumors. And people always talk about, oh, well, this kind is the good kind, or this is the kind that doesn't cause cancer. That's not true. They, they're both cancerous, but they behave differently. So first of all, a tumor is a mass of abnormal cells. The benign tumor are abnormal cells that have all stayed in the same place. The good thing with a benign tumor is that P53 eventually realized something was wrong and has been able to stop cell divisions. Because the cells, those cancer cells, are no longer dividing because of P53, it doesn't really cause a serious problem. And, we can, and because they haven't moved around in your system, we can normally get them all out through surgery. The tumor that's the real issue are malignant tumors. And these are the ones that have mastitized. Mastitized. Sorry, I can never say that word. Anyway, they have left the original site. So let's say you had cancer of the liver. Well, now this cancer is everywhere. It's in your heart. It's in your lungs. It's in your blood marrow. It's everywhere. So these are the ones that attach. They lose attachment to cells that are close to them. And they move around through your blood and your lymphatic system to other tissues, and they can thereby infect other tissues. They start more tumors in new areas of your body. So not only do we have to worry about the cancer, we now have to worry about the cancer that's moving around and shutting down the functions of other organs. And because it's moving around, we can't get it all. Some of them can be huge, which are easy to find. Some of them can be really small, which are even harder to find. So what are some treatments? Well, we know there's no cure, at least not yet. Most of the treatments sometimes end up doing more, more damage. I, I don't want to say more damage than good, but sometimes just as much damage as the cancer. The initial way of treating cancer was to target the cells that are rapidly dividing. That's the issue, so that's what we need to get rid of. The two options, for the, the most part, are high-energy radiation, that kills rapidly dividing cells, and then chemotherapy, which stops DNA replication, it stops mitosis and cytokinesis, and chemotherapy also stops blood vessel growth. The issue with these are they can affect healthy cells and tissue just as much as they can affect cancerous cells and tissues. So, Obviously, a new way needs to be found. Now, for people who are just undergoing cancer, or sometimes undergoing, you know, they caught it late, so they're, they're quickly progressing along the stages of cancer, we still have to do chemotherapy or radiation because you want to try and kill off as much as you can, and then you can start working on the individuals. But the new approach to cancer treatment is through what we call miracle drugs. And these drugs target enzymes and proteins found only in cancerous cells. Cancerous cells produce a series of proteins and, uh, proteins and enzymes that aren't found in healthy cells. So they're developing and have developed drugs that target those particular proteins and those particular enzymes. A classic example is the drug Gleevec, which is a treatment for adult leukemia and also for some forms of stomach cancer. This one it was a big deal because it was the first successful drug that targeted only cancer cells. It left all of the healthy cells and tissues alone and only dealt with the cancerous cells and the cancerous tissues. Right? So th that's a better situation than chemotherapy and radiation that's going to work on everything. All right? So Oh, maybe I need to tell you what what some of these um <laughs> what some of these acronyms mean. GISD stands for gastrointestinal stromal tumors, which affect easily five um five thousand people in the U.S. alone. Um, CML, excuse me, stands for chronic my I can never say this myelogenous. Leukemia, which is an adult type of leukemia that can affect up to as many up to as many as eight thousand people. So, just two fairly deadly forms. All right. I hope this was clear and not too you know not too difficult to understand. the The main thing is you have to know that 
They're checkpoints that regulate your cell cycle. There are certain genes that either promote or inhibit cell division. If those genes go rogue, it can cause cancer and various other situations. Hope this was helpful. I'll see you guys in class. Bye.